Did you guys go to the game last night? Yeah, that was crazy. crazy. Yeah, it was crazy. It was intense. It looks like one of the best games I've been in a while. I think we got a shot at the championships. You think so? So. That would be so cool. What? Do you think you'd recognize inflation if you saw it? I don't, I don't get it. The price just keeps doubling. I hear you. But what if it costs double that? Or triple? What if you needed a wheelbarrow of bills just for a soda? Really? You're joking, right? Afraid not. And it happened not too far away and not too long ago. You'll learn about that in a few minutes. Hi. You see, there's something that can happen without you ever knowing. Something you can't control that will make everything cost more. It's called inflation, and it's all about too much money. Okay, people, tell me, what is inflation? No, I'm thinking inflation means like uh, cost of living and things, everything is going up. Oh man, I'm an econ, my professor would tell me. I'm not an econ. Um, but... Yeah, they raise taxes and try to get you to pay more money. And increase in prices of goods, services, increasing wages. The stock market. You know, I don't know. The worthlessness of money. There's too much like physical money in circulation, so the value goes down. Bingo! What was that again? It's when um, there's too much money printed, and so uh, the money will soon become worth worthless. Well, the government is printing too much money. That's one of the reasons. Let's check in with an expert. Meet Lawrence Reed. He's president of the Foundation for Economic Education. I'm impressed. Some of those people nailed it. Simply put, inflation is when government creates too much money, which causes a fall in its purchasing power. Let me repeat, when government creates too much money, its purchasing power goes down as the prices of almost everything you want go up. This is different from the routine rise and fall of prices due to supply and demand. Some prices go up and some go down because of natural fluctuations in the marketplace. But make no mistake about it, when the prices of almost everything you buy go up, it's because the government, through its Federal Reserve System, is inflating the money supply by printing too much money. Too much money? How could it be too much money? See, I don't have to worry about too much money. I got the power of plastic. Oh, that looks like a disaster waiting to happen. Because using a credit card doesn't mean you can buy whatever you want. See, you get credit based on how much you earn and your ability to pay back what you borrow, now or later. So, whether you're living large with a great line of credit or have a short leash like our friend there, everybody has a limit and at some point has to say no. But not the government. Government buys a lot of stuff on credit, and I mean real big ticket stuff like airplanes and roads and bridges and pensions for workers and healthcare services. Not to mention subsidies and corporate welfare. Government can spend a lot of money because it can print a lot of money. Governments don't like to say no because frankly, they're made up of politicians who want to get elected. To get elected, they have to make promises. And to make good on those promises, they need money. It's easy enough for them to just print it, especially if it has no backing. They can even print as much as they decide to, even if it exceeds the government's income from taxing its citizens, or borrowing from its citizens, or borrowing from another country. It's like writing a check for more than you have in the bank. If you or I tried that, we'd end up on court TV. So why would a government do it? Sometimes desperate times call for desperate measures with disastrous results. Let's head back to 1777 and visit uh, this familiar face. I suppose most of you are aware that I was the first president of these United States of America. And I suspect many of you also know that I was the commander of all the American forces during the War of American Independence, the Revolutionary War. That war, it was not going very well for us. I had employed a Fabian strategy, uh, what you would call a guerrilla war against the British. Now, we did enjoy some victories. But if truth be told, we suffered far more in the way of failures than defeats. 
In the winter of 1777, my soldiers and I almost became statistics. You see, we were encamped here at the Valley of the Forge, and we almost starved to death. Much of the blame lay at the feet of the Congress. They were desperate for money to wage the war. The only problem is they didn't have any of it. So they printed it, lots of it. The money was called Continentals. The more they printed of it, the less it was worth. There was no gold, there was no silver to back it up. <laughs> Truth be told, it had virtually no value. We could only pay our troops $8 a month, but that would not even feed a man for a week, let alone clothe him. As if that were not bad enough, the British started spreading counterfeit Continentals around. Inflation as an act of war. Fairly clever, don't you think? It was so bad that we could not afford to buy meat or vegetables. We survived mostly on bread and water. The area farmers, they could not afford to sell us their wares. Our currency was worthless. And so instead, they sold to the British in Philadelphia City. Sounds unpatriotic. But like I told the Congress, Farmers need to feed their families as well, and they cannot survive by eating the spirit of 70 and 6. And do not forget, the British paid for their goods with gold. <coughs> it was a nightmare of a winter. In general, prices at Valley Forge were 480% higher than they were at the beginning of the war. That's what we call hyperinflation. And whose fault was that? I'll give you a hint. Try the guys who cranked out millions of Continentals without any backing whatsoever, just hoping that people would accept them. What other ways can governments cause inflation? Let's go back two centuries before George and his troops toughed it out in Valley Forge. These are the ancient Incas, and that's not paint they're coating their king with. Legend has it that Inca kings were ceremoniously painted head to foot with gold. See, the mountains of South and Central America were so full of pure gold, the Incas could literally paint the town with it. They didn't use it as money, they used it for ceremony and decoration. But the Spanish conquistadors didn't think of it only as decoration. To them, it was wealth, and they grabbed up every gram they could and loaded up their galleons. From 1500 to 1800, they carted 70% of the world's gold and 85% of its silver back to Spain. The world had never seen anything like it. When the Inca gold got there, it became Spanish money, because in Spain at the time, gold and silver were money. And too much gold and silver created the same problem as too many continentals, though not nearly as bad. As a result, over the course of a century, prices of everything shot up 400%. Suddenly, gold was everywhere. It was the century of gold. The supply of money was increased dramatically, and the value of money, gold, and silver predictably went down. And down went everyone's buying power. It became known as price inflation. Gold decorated the altars of churches, was painted onto statues and artwork, and adorned the bodies and clothing of royalty. But people still valued gold highly as money. A 400% price increase sounds pretty bad, doesn't it? But in the next century, Europe had inflation that made 400% look like a speed bump. World War I lasted from 1914 until 1918. In the end, much of Europe was in ruin. The Allies had triumphed and Germany had been defeated. And it was time for payback. The Allies, though America objected, presented the German government with a bill for 132 billion gold marks. That's billion with a B. It was twice Germany's annual income. Desperate, facing a bill they didn't have the money to pay, the Germans did just what America's Continental Congress did in 1777. They fired up the printing press and pumped out the paper. 
At the end of the war, one dollar would buy roughly four marks. Five years later, one dollar would buy 4.2 trillion marks. That's trillion with a T. Ordinary citizens suffered the most. Germany's birth rate fell and the death rate rose. Infant mortality climbed by 21%, and on the black market, cigarettes became the new money. The government's money was so worthless, a whole wheelbarrow of it couldn't buy a loaf of bread. You might as well use it for wallpaper, for kindling. By 1930, all that crazy, out-of-control printing of money had destroyed the economy of Germany. Everyone was broke, angry, and looking for a way out. Within the next decade, a little-known Austrian corporal came to power, convincing the country he could save them. Problem was, that little corporal was Adolf Hitler. And his solution was the beginnings of National Socialism, and the beginnings of a global nightmare that would lead to World War II. People really knew how to mess up their economies back then. But hold up, it's not just ancient history. Hyperinflation can happen even today. Ask the people of La Paz, Bolivia. They'll tell you about the hyperinflation of the 1980s. They'll never forget its effects, and neither will Lawrence Reed, because he was there back then and saw firsthand what inflation could do to a nation and its people. You see this stack of one million Bolivian pesos? In 1978, it was worth 40,000 US dollars. But by the time I got to Bolivia in 1985, prices were soaring at an annual rate of some 50,000%, and they went on up from there. So for one dollar, on the day I arrived, I could get 150,000 pesos. But two weeks later, one dollar got me 200,000 pesos. So this stack cost me just five bucks. Now what do you suppose that kind of hyperinflation did to ordinary Bolivians? The cost of everything went up. Meat, eggs, all groceries, clothing, hardware, cars, housing. Even an everyday item, like a bottle of cola, was rocketing up in price, and it created problems for everybody, from the vendor who sold it in markets like this to the company that made and bottled it. Senior Tedeschi is the general manager of La Cascada, and he remembers what those times were like. What was the price of one bottle of your product before the inflation began, and what was the price on the last day when the hyperinflation ended? Una botella de dos litros, nosotros vendíamos a two-liter bottle at the beginning sold for five Bolivian pesos. We would end up selling the same bottle for about 40 to 50 million Bolivian pesos. We would deliver them in the morning at a specific price and within half an hour or an hour the price was changing. Did you see the hyperinflation coming or did it come as a surprise and rather suddenly? We did see inflation coming, but never did we expect that inflation could reach the level it reached in Bolivia. Paper money was plunging so fast in value that people would rush to convert it into anything of stable value. Commodities like food, clothing, electronics. Even families without electricity bought electronic goods as a hedge against rising prices. Out of necessity, many Bolivians adopted this as currency. It's a mentholated rub that you'd put on your chest if you had a cold. A very good product, but money? Tell me the story of why, during the hyperinflation, people began using this as money. Okay, it's a lot of reasons. In the first place, people knew that this product is popular with all Bolivians and because it is a product that is really good for many illnesses. Some people kept it as a monetary reserve because it kept its value and did not devaluate like the money in Bolivia. Bolivian pesos were becoming less valuable every day. But people needed something stable, something familiar, so they could buy and sell with each other. It was a very crazy time. Because the inflation was so fast that people no longer knew how to support their families. Many of the rich made it through. Some prospered, some left the country. A lot of the middle class was wiped out. All of their savings gone. The poor were devastated because their incomes could not keep up with rising prices. 
Hyperinflation in Bolivia happened not all that long ago, within the lifetimes of your parents. It caused a lot of trouble and ruined many lives. And Bolivia is not all that far away. So bad economic policy has destroyed the livelihoods of millions of people around the world and across oceans of time. It couldn't happen here. Could it? Well, hyperinflation happened in Bolivia in the 1980s, it happened in Germany in the 1920s, and it happened in America in the 1700s. Remember, inflation and rising prices are connected, but it's important to remember that inflation causes rising prices, not the other way around. Hey, we all love money and we all want more, but as long as governments control the creation and distribution of it, inflation is a real and serious possibility. It's about exercising control and saying no when you can't afford something. And shouldn't that go for you and me and for the government? Sometimes more isn't better, and there really is such a thing as too much money.